um, I'll note right now that Lynette is here. And if you want to already send her any questions you might want to ask, go ahead. But we'll do the kind of class overview and, and whatnot first. So hope you all had a good weekend. Saw a lot of good questions about the homework, other class concepts. I've seen several of you in office hours. So uh, yeah, things seem to be going well. About the sharing of class recordings. So you hopefully saw my announcement on the um, Canvas discu uh, discussion board, but I've moved everything over to YouTube. And so moving forward, that's where you'll be able to find all the recordings for the whole quarter. And uh, if you have any trouble with that, just let me know right away. I do have the, the original files all on a Google Drive, so it's not like anything's gone if something does happen. A uh, quick update on what's going on in class. So homework three is due uh, later this week. So that's um, had about a week and a half to complete that. And then um, there is quiz three this coming Friday in the afternoon, same format. A little bit of feedback from quiz two after talking with the TAs. So it's really essential that um, all of you are comfortable with uh, promptly turning in the course material and making sure you can submit the work on time. There's been a number of cases that we've been very lenient on about uh, turning in late work. And we're not going to be able to kind of continue accepting uh, late work if there's kind of a repeat person who's doing that over and over again. So if you're at all concerned about your ability to turn in some of the course materials on campus, please reach out to the TAs right away. Um, there's a bunch of things we can do to help you, but moving forward, we're really going to need kind of compliance. And I'll talk a little bit about the exam on the next slide that's coming up next week. Um, and it's just, you know, it'll be even more essential that you're all able to sort of adhere to those standards that we set. Reminder that the Aspen project is going to be starting in a few weeks after the exam. Um, so we're in week five now, and the, and the Aspen project will be released in week seven. You should work with Jesse Chim from Chemi IT if you can't yet use Aspen. So um, we've tried to be really clear in our communication about what's required for the class, and we're going to be providing full support to get everybody using Aspen. And we're going to need to make sure you can all do that before the project starts, because uh, if we don't hear from you, our assumption is that you're able to use Aspen. Um, and then I'll do a quick review of the class feedback, recap of our content from Thursday, and then we're gonna jump in and do a couple more advanced concepts for column design and an, uh, kind of a lengthier example problem again to illustrate some of those concepts. I've got my dogs here kind of trapped in this office area with me today, so I apologize if you see them running around or they're making a little bit of noise. Um, they're kind of riled up. Okay, upcoming midterm exam next week, Thursday, May 7th. Um, You'll be able to send qu uh, questions to the TAs via Zoom chat feature. The exam will be synchronously completed next Thursday from 12 p.m. to 1.15 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, you must begin the exam at the same time. And here's the deal. The exam ends at 1.15. And so by the honor code, you will stop working on the exam at that time. You won't take any more time. And then, um, you know, I expect you to tell me if you've decided to keep working on the exam and we can take appropriate action. There's a 10 minute window to turn in your exam electronically past that. That should be sufficient um, for how long we expect these things to take. And there's gonna be a defined sort of penalty. If you turn in the exam after 125, uh, we, we expect to kind of have a 50% deduction. Um, and let us know again right away. We will do everything to help you be able to, to be successful turning in your materials, uh, but we, we have to sort of have a fair standard here for everybody who's uh, doing the exam so that you're all playing by the same rules. Okay, class feedback. So really great response rate. Thank you all so much for taking the time to do that. I think 75% uh, of you taking a few minutes to send some feedback is really appreciated. Um, general kind of big picture items you can read these this table later if you want but it might help you kind of calibrate uh, i always think it's good to to show the results of surveys like this because then you can sort of understand where you fit in the spectrum of people who responded um, so you know you can see there kind of how people responded to these four statistical questions about my ability to engage with course concepts keep up with the course requirements and then a couple questions about kind of how you feel the instructor is doing 
there was a lot of written comments. Thank you all for uh, providing some substantial suggestions. And there was a lot of common themes in those comments. So um, access to course materials, flexible approach, et cetera, all that um, I was glad to see um, has, uh, is, is being appreciated. And a number of you noted the reduced volume of work compared to a, a typical chemi class. And just as a kind of calibrating point, this class would typically have three exams and eight homework assignments, um, or two exams, a project, and eight homework assignments. So uh, we have reduced the, the volume of work trying to be mindful of everything that's going on and the additional burdens that are happening right now. Um, and, and I'm glad that you guys are sort of um, appreciating that and hopefully you're enjoying the, the work that you're doing a little more as a result of that. Some concerns that emerged were really um, about the speed of class content and the speed that we're going. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we're trying, what I'm gonna try this week to uh, address that. Also, the volume of lecture content came up. Um, the reality is, as I noted in the first week of class, there's just a lot to get done in 10 weeks. And um, even though we're reducing the, the like the sort of substantive evaluation via homework and quizzes and exams, that, that volume of work is down. I can't really short the volume of content that I'm teaching you guys. So uh, we're going to have to figure out a way to um, handle the intake of this volume of work or pick and choose about what, what it is that you're able to focus on. So some kind of big picture suggestions from me to the class are as follows. So number one, um, if you're participating synchronously and most of you are, so on any given day there's around 60 or more students kind of present in the Zoom call. Um, so the you know, 60 out of 68 students are sort of here. I just want to reiterate, um, unlike a traditional class where a prof is writing on the board and you feel that urgency to write everything down, just remember um, all of my abbreviated notes will, and recordings will be made available. My goal, of course, is that you don't have to watch the lecture and then go return to watch the lecture again. That's not what I'm trying to do here. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is um, not have too many slides with incomplete material. I'm going to try and slow down a little bit where I can. And just want to encourage everybody to experiment with their approach to class. Um, especially if you're not somebody who asks questions during lecture, you, I would encourage you to perhaps think about asynchronous participation. You might find it a better uh, use of your time and more efficient if you're going to go through the notes, pause the recording, take some additional notes, and think about a concept. My, my goal is um, um, my goal is not for you to have to go through both. Um, so. Again, um, if you need any help or there's anything that we can do to support you, please ask. Um, the, the worst thing you could do is not ask for help if you feel like you need it. Um, it's my job to get you help. And, and so I always remind people that who work in my research group or faculty that I'm responsible for as department chair, um, your responsibility as a student or a member of my classroom is to ask for what you think you need. My responsibility is to, to do my best to give you what I think you need. And sometimes that means I, I won't give you exactly what you asked for, but just know that I have your best interest at heart and I'm gonna do everything to try and help you be successful. So with that, let's jump in. Um, just a very brief recap from what we talked about last Thursday. Uh, there were a couple new design concepts about um, designer uh, design of uh, absorbers and stripping towers. So we learned this idea about the minimum liquid flow rate for the absorber and the minimum um, kind of vapor flow rate for the stripping tower. And we learned that that's sort of a design constraint that we're going to work around and then build out uh, a column that has some kind of flow rate, maybe twice that number, something of that nature. We learned how to determine the number of equilibrium stages. Uh, and then we also did introduction to absorber design in Aspen. So in terms of our graphical design things that we really focused on last week, there was in these minimum flow rate things, the determination of this pinch point was really important. And then this idea here illustrated on the right of um, stepping off stages on this graphical uh, approach for dilute absorption and dilute stripping towers. Um, so I'll just pause a moment right now and see if there's any specific questions about that content that we covered. Uh, again, I'm not going to address specific homework questions here. We don't have time for that, unfortunately. Uh, but please send anything to Lynette right now uh, if you want to, or raise your hand, of course, if you want to participate. Um, let me know if there's any questions and I can review any quick concepts before you move on. We're going to dig into all this a little more today. So if something is not clear, 
um, I'd like to take the chance right now to clear it up a little bit for you. Okay, I don't see anything. Oh, here's one question coming in. Um, Slack channel, so I'll pause one second. So there's a question for clarification on what the pinch point means. So let me uh, elaborate on that a little bit. So I'm gonna just quickly sketch this XY diagram right here, and then uh, we'll define the pinch point and explain its importance. So we have our capital X, capital Y diagram from the absorber. We have some equilibrium curve. I'll do it in context of the absorber, but everything that I'm gonna tell you is true also for the, uh, the stripping tower as well. So once we um, determine, for example, these are the conditions in the absorber at the top of the absorption column. And um, when we're doing this analysis to determine the minimum liquid flow rate in the absorber, what we do is intersect the operating line with the equilibrium line at some point. Now this point is gonna have significance either for the X or the Y value. So these are the quantities, this would be um, the, the liquid coming out, this is the bottom of the column, or the gas coming in. So in the absorber, that is the bottom of the column. And so we know one of those two quantities typically in order to do this analysis. The pinch point is where we no longer have driving force for separation. And it's a theoretical position where we can't actually operate the column at that level because the number of, of equilibrium stages is uh, infinite. So just the, the concept there is at the pinch point. So at the pinch, there's uh, no driving force for separation. And uh, the number of equilibrium stages goes to infinity because there is no driving force for separation. So that is the main concept there. Um, the a clarifying question that just came up is, is this for graphical analysis only or is it for uh, dilute feed? So although right now we're doing uh, analysis of dilute systems, so absorption and, and stripping in dilute context, this concept of the pinch point where your operating line uh, intersects with the equilibrium line is also going to be uh, relevant in distillation. We'll see that either on Thursday or Tuesday of next week. So, so anytime that you have the uh, graphical design of a separator, whether, you know, for absorption, stripping, and distillation, the intersection of the operating line with the equilibrium line is, is what we call a pinch point. And then at that, at that moment, um, we have, uh, again, this sort of very rapid approach toward a, a theoretical infinite number of stages. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit what's going on. Um, yeah, sorry, I keep looking over my shoulder. My dog's kind of having a fit. I don't know why. Uh, we kind of set up my house a little different this afternoon. So we'll just deal with it. I think he'll be fine. Um, so I don't see any other questions. And um, let's go ahead and move on. I'm going to switch over to my laptop and the PowerPoint screen because we're going to go back and look at a few of those um, kind of movies from AICHE Exchange again when we introduce some concepts about efficiency. So we'll do that for a few minutes. And I'm hopeful that today I'll be able to get the um, audio working. So let's see here. One second. All right. So jumping in, um, this concept is really important. And we're going to talk for a while about this today. Thus far, we have really focused on this idea of an equilibrium stage. So in an equilibrium stage, we have all of our vapor liquid equilibrium from prior um, analysis. We know how to do all that. We've talked about it in this class, we did in thermo. Now, in reality, we don't, off, we, we don't often perfectly reach equilibrium. And depending on how we're operating the column, 
we will um, be further or closer to equilibrium. And so one thing you really need to think about clearly is that a failure to reach equilibrium is a loss in efficiency in your column. And so what we're going to do today is learn how to analyze that, learn how to analyze that loss of efficiency. So um, you can remember now thinking back a couple weeks to module one when we talked about mass transfer, the capacity of a system to reach equilibrium is determined by mass transfer fluxes and surface areas between phases. So depending on how we're operating the column, it will affect both of those things. So there's in general three different ways that we talk about in this course that are kind of big picture ways that the column operation can fail, which will lead to reduced performance and loss of efficiency in the column. And, and so these are called entrainment or equivalently, equivalently entrainment flooding. And so in entrainment flooding, what that means is the vapor flow is too high. We're gonna watch a illustration of what this looks like in just a moment. But when the vapor flow is too high, it carries up some of that froth or foam from the stage uh, up the column. Uh, the opposite of that is downcomer flooding or flooding. And in that case, the liquid flow is too high and the downcomer uh, can be overwhelmed and there's too much liquid flowing down. And you can hopefully immediately imagine why um, either of these cases could lead to uh, a situation where we're not achieving equilibrium. And then the third case is called weeping. And when this has to do with the physical engineering or the design of the um, trays themselves, or even packing, depending, um, in this case, the vapor flow is too low. And we have uh, the inability to have holdup in the column and we're not, the uh, liquid just kind of pours down because there's not enough uh, literal upward force uh, to hold the liquid up in the column. So in general, these concepts are much more easy to understand with the trade tower, but they all also apply equally in packed columns. Uh, we just have to think a little more about what that might look like. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna show two of these AICG kind of uh, academy videos, one about entrainment flooding, and one about weeping. So it's what we're gonna kind of go over. And then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna talk about how in the real life this is actually uh, observed when you're out there as a process engineer working, how would you know this is happening? So let me quickly um, I think this is gonna work. See if we're successful here. Um, so this is uh entrainment or entrainment flooding. So this this example here deals with um, upward vapor flow. And I think we'll be okay here. A flooding condition occurs when the froth level approaches the tray above. Flooding occurs at high vapor rates and results in a significantly lower efficiency. At these high vapor rates, the vapor carries much of the liquid up with it to the next tray. This recycling of the liquid is called entrainment. Entrainment mixes the stages together and reduces the counter current effect of the column. Flooded columns are also difficult, if not impossible to control, as the separation performance will decrease dramatically. Okay, so that's the example of um, entrainment or entrainment flooding. This concept of weeping is what we'll talk about next. So let's have a look at this. Again, it's just a 45 seconds to a minute. An opposite performance problem occurs at low vapor rates, weeping. If the vapor velocity is low, it is possible for liquid to flow down through the tray holes before mixing the vapor. Weeping has been an important consideration in designing the different tray types. The potential is largest for sieve trays, which have no built-in protection against liquid draining through the holes. Valve trays can also weep, since the valve units are designed not to close completely at zero vapor rate. Bubble cap trays have considerable protection against weeping as one of their design strengths.
Counter flow trays weep as part of the design. Okay, so that gives you hopefully a good kind of visual picture of what some of these phenomena look like. Now, that's a kind of cartoon illustration of what's happening. What I want to talk about now for a moment is, is how you would know this is happening if you were a process engineer uh, in a plant running a, a separation piece of equipment. So um, in general, there are not convenient ways to see inside of a distillation column that's operating in industry. Some columns uh, have to be designed of materials uh, that can't be visible. Like, for example, you may not have glass because of the really acidic conditions. Uh, sometimes you have very high pressure conditions. So in many cases, frequently, it's not feasible to look with your eyes inside the column as sort of a, a way to see what's going on. In contrast, some columns in, in some cases have a, a small window, which is called a sight glass. So here's an, a picture here in the upper right hand corner of what a sight glass looks like. And if you ever, these are also embedded in reactors. So this is a frequent way, uh, you know, as a zero order quality control for an operator or an engineer to understand what's going on. This is an example of a batch distillation that's um, part of a fermentation rig for um, production of spirits, so whiskey or vodka or something like that. Um, these are not typically sample ports, so you don't open this while you're operating the column. You can imagine that you know the diameter is rather large. You could um, really disrupt the column performance and there'd be a safety issue. Columns do also have sample ports. So in Chemi 437 next winter, you'll, you'll actually run a distillation column. You'll take samples from it while it's operating. And so the, the idea there is that an operator uh, never the process engineer in general, but the operator will will take a syringe, insert it through a, um, a membrane that that's not permeable, and draw vapor or liquid samples from a from an equilibrium stage. And then, it, if you're not familiar, manufacturing facilities have a special unit called QC for quality control or QA quality assurance. And there's a whole separate in chemical plants. There's an analytical chemistry group where uh, an operator will drop off a sample. And they'll do analysis of that sample to make sure the composition is as you would expect. So um, you'll be able to do a little bit of this in 437 next winter, but this is kind of big picture how, um, how this might work. This still doesn't tell you though um, some of these key things that we, we just looked at. So vapor, vapor flow rates that are too high, liquid flow rates that might be too high or too low. And so I want to, um, you know, kind of point out large scale columns that have seven, you know, 50, 75, 100 stages that are designed to analyze huge vol or process huge volumes of uh, chemical feedstocks, petroleum feedstocks, uh, don't really have ways to, um, for the operator to check. And so there are non invasive techniques, and there's entire companies that are devoted toward helping people understand what is going on inside their columns. And I want to um, show you one more video that gives you one example of how this might work out in the real world and in industry. So um, let me share that screen back to Chrome. So this is from a company called TowerScan. It's a small, I, I don't know actually where the company is, but it's a, probably a small supplier that works, you know, uh, somewhere in the Gulf Coast or Eastern Seaboard or California. And let's look at this little uh, analysis here that the engineer is going to provide. This is an example of a gamma scan of a tower with fairly uncommon multiple downcomer type trays, as shown in the picture here and also reproduced in the plan view taken from the tower drawings. So just as a quick note, the, um, the type of downcomer is not super important here to this discussion, but uh, this is a little more sophisticated than the idealized versions we were looking at. So this is a specialized um, engineered tray with, uh, you can see four different downcomers um, and it's for, for whatever chemical process they're using. So not really important for the rest of the video, but I wanted to clarify that point. In this case, the source and detector were positioned so that a gamma scan path was possible in between the downcomers. Now, tower scan was contacted to determine possible causes for an increased pressure drop across the tower. So, clarification here, they're going to use a non-invasive uh, gamma scan, so a, ra a radiation technique, in order to probe the resistance of the material inside the column to uh, being subject to some to gamma rays. And you can see they're very carefully thinking about where they're applying the source and detector for this tower, which was forced in operations to run at reduced rates. 
To pinpoint the problem, a total of three scans were done and the results will be shown here, with the column schematic on the right hand side of the screen and the gamma scan results in the form of a density plot on the left. The first scan was performed at the current reduced rates. The scan revealed that tray 40, the third tray from the top, was heavily loaded and on the verge of flooding. So what you're looking at here, in case that went too fast, was the following. So the y-axis is um, height, so it corresponds to the, the trays that are shown there. And then the x-axis that's going left and right, you can probably follow my mouse a little bit, is density of fluid. So he's explaining that at the top of the column above tray 40 on this tower, there's a huge increase in the amount of fluid there. A second scan at slightly increased rates was then performed. That scan showed that the flood increased from tray 40 up to the top of the tower. Trays 39 and below showed no increase in hydraulic loadings, indicating a restriction of some sort to the liquid flow from tray 40 to tray 39. So, so again, just to, in case you missed what was there, what they did was they increased the liquid flow rate and they did a scan again. And what they found in the second scan, what they're doing is they're moving synchronously this um, gamma source and gamma detector vertically down the outside of the column they saw that the top of the column basically filled with fluid from uh, tray 40 on up. So what this indicates is some sort of partial or complete, not complete, but a, uh, a partial blockage of the downcomers on tray 40. Such as plugging of the downcomers as opposed to a vapor induced or jet flood. A post wash follow up scan was performed and showed that the trays were now all consistently loaded and operating with good liquid vapor disengagement. So, in summary, the first gamma scan at reduced rate showed a heavily loaded tray. Second scan showed a backup flood on that tray. And the third gamma scan, a baseline scan, provided a clean profile of the tower. Thank you for your So, that's super cool. Um, what we just learned there was a little bit about not only how um, this is done in industry in terms of analyzing failure modes in columns, but also how, how, in case you missed it, they were able to diagnose the type of failure mode. So not only was the column just flooding, they were able to specifically learn what type of flooding was occurring. And um, I, I found that super interesting and you can get some flavor for what's kind of going on out here in the real world when uh, columns begin to perform at a lower level. So feel free to go watch that again or uh, research other types of um, content like that you can easily find on YouTube. Okay, so kind of getting into it now, putting it all together, what I, what I like to do, um, I take this diagram figure 621 and make it a little more simple. And the essential thing for you as a student in this class is to be able to understand when you're in a normal operating mode, uh, what, is, what are possible effects if you um, decrease or increase liquid flow rate. So, um, you know, if you're here, I'm gonna draw a red dot sort of in the center of the normal operation regime. So at some value, you know, if this were an absorber, this would be some specific value of operating at L prime and D prime. And we can see what happens, for example, if we begin to um, lower the vapor flow rate. If we lower the vapor flow rate, we're gonna, depending on where we are in the operating of that column, we will get to weeping. If we increase the liquid flow rate, we're gonna go this direction. And we're going to move over to this regime of downcomer flooding. And it, here, if we decrease the liquid flow rate, uh, we're going to lose our force balance and we're going to go to this regime of entrainment flooding. Um, so this is really important qualitative information that's all in the learning objectives. You do need to understand this. So go back and watch this segment of the class again if you have further questions about that. What we're going to do now is now kind of move back to the mathematical realm and begin to learn how to analyze uh, loss of efficiency. So we're not gonna talk about specific reasons why we're losing efficiency. We're going to define some different efficiency metrics and then see what happens when we apply that to the design of absorbers and strippers. Keep in mind, everything I'm gonna talk about now, all of these concepts are gonna sort of also then apply to distillation when we get there, when we again move away from the ideal operation. So, if we don't reach equilibrium, what this means is that in order to achieve a fixed amount of separation, um, the number of stages that we would need in real life, so that's listed here as kind of an actual, is going to exceed 
the number of theoretical stages, for, for example, that we would design with the equilibrium assumption. That'll be labeled on future slides as uh, NA and NT. So we have this sort of uh, situation where there's, we need more stages than we think we do. What this means in the absorber um, is that the, the gas concentration um, coming out of the top of the absorber to, to the actual solute, um, the amount of solute leaving the absorber is gonna be higher than we expect. So we haven't done uh, the job that we wanted to do. So jumping in, let's kind of zoom in on one equilibrium stage that I'll illustrate as a tray and begin to think about how, um, how this would work. So the first thing we'll do is define some overall metrics for the entire tower. And, and in the case that we know both of these quantities, we know both the equilibrium or the, the number of theoretical stages and the number of actual stages. So we can define this E0 term, the overall stage efficiency. And this is an average um, stage efficiency for the entire tower. E0 is something that's useful to analyze like how the whole tower would work. It, it often is not known in advance and it's, um, it's something that won't really assist us in the design or analysis of, a, of an operating system. So we typically don't use this other than to make a general comment about, about the uh, overall operating. So the, the, what we're gonna do now is spend some time with these quantities called uh, Murphy uh, efficiencies. So Murphy simply is named after somebody who was uh, an important process engineer in the chemical oil and gas industry. And in analyzing separators, there is this concept of a specific stage efficiency. So looking over here at this diagram, let me define all these variables for you. Starting at the top, this quantity here is the mole fraction of some species I, so the liquid phase mole fraction, uh, from the next stage up coming into the column. And that's going to be slightly different than the, the on stage mole fraction, X, Xi, comma N. So that's really what we're going to be analyzing here. This stage, of course, has vapor flowing up. So that, um, just like we kind of labeled last week, we have some N plus one, so going down one stage. Vapor, uh, vapor phase mole fraction of the component I. And Xi and Yi are gonna be in equilibrium, right? So we're, we're emitting vapor from that, that froth. The vapor that's leaving that froth is in equilibrium with that liquid. And the downcomer is of course um, having a, a liquid go down at the same concentration leaving, leaving the tray. The new quantity that's defined here, it has a star, so Yi star, is the, is the following. Uh, this is a theoretical vapor phase mole fraction of component I that's in equilibrium with liquid of, uh, uh, of Xi. So what we're able to think about now is, is taking a sample of the liquid Xi, doing a vapor liquid equilibrium calculation, and then computing what should Yi be. And so the gap between the theoretical an actual vapor phase composition tells us about uh, the, the efficiency. And that gets all formulated here in this Mur Murphy vapor efficiency, which tells us about the difference uh, between composition of YIN. You, you can just kind of follow through here. So there's a delta Y and then a delta Y compared to the actual right there. So this is sort of a, what you're achieving in real life in terms of difference in your vapor phase um, separation, and then what you ought to be achieving given that liquid phase composition. The thing I wanna note is this is related to the average liquid composition on stage. So at this point, we're just assuming uh, that that liquid is going to be well mixed and that we're going to, going to be able to sort of have this average liquid composition, which would lead to an average type of uh, vapor separation. So keep that in your mind and we'll come back to it in just a moment. So what's interesting, and we'll, we'll use it on the next slide just to think about some concepts. We won't come back to this math, but um, if we take this overall or stage averaged approach, we can relate this quantity, uh, this Murphy vapor efficiency directly to mass transfer concepts. So the derivation I'm not gonna go over, 
um, I'm not gonna go over it because we won't be spending a lot of time with these relationships and I'll just refer you to page 222 in your textbook if you want to see the derivation. But what I want to um, kind of just point out at a high level, if you do a shell balance on a slab of liquid in that tray and you assume that that shell has well-mixed liquid, you can then derive uh, by doing a, an integration over the amount of material leaving with kind of film theory, you can derive this new quantity, uh, at, which is labeled NOG, and it's called, uh, in separations world, it's called the number of gas phase mass transfer units. So a mass transfer unit um, essentially is, is kind of referring to um, a dimensionless amount of mass transfer that's occurring. And we'll see how it relates to efficiency in a moment. And you, I think you'll be able to get a little bit of instinct. But what, what I want you to know and, and sort of think about is this relationship here that's derived in your book. So the, the gas transfer unit is defined as a mass transfer coefficient kg. Um, this comes from a, a, an, an analog to one film theory, which is two film theory. We're not going to cover it in class, but it in your mind, you can just think about film theory. So this is a mass transfer coefficient of the type we talked about three weeks ago. And then uh, these quantities come up a lot in engineering. So this is a, an interfacial vapor liquid area. Of course, we know that's really important for mass transfer, but it's on a per volume basis. And that's volume of holdup, that froth that's sitting on the stage. So that quantity A is measured from experiment that tells us how much surface area do we have uh, per volume of mass transfer. This mass transfer coefficient is typically written in units of partial pressure, not concentration. So we have a pressure, and then we have the height of the holdup on tray. And here in the denominator is uh, the molar gas flow rate. It's not volume. It's the V that we've been sort of thinking about for absorption, and then the surface area on tray. So this, this quantity is dimensionless, and um, it, it essentially is related to the amount, uh, a normalized amount of uh, mass transfer that's occurring. And what you can see in the derivation is that the, if you know this quantity, NOG, the Murphy efficiency for that stage with this well-mixed assumption can be directly calculated. So this is useful mostly so that we can begin to think about what are the quantities that will affect efficiency and in what manner, what are the mathematical relationships that the mass transfer coefficient might factor into efficiency. So I'd like you to go back and think about this. Uh, again, don't stress about the derivation, but the, the relationships here are valuable. So now, um, let's think about real life. In real life, we, we actually take a sample from some specific spot in that tray. I mentioned earlier, there's like sample ports. Um, this is literally something you'll do in Chem E437. You will use a syringe through a, a kind of polymer membrane and you'll at some point on that stage take a sample. So sometimes the liquid is not well mixed depending on the flow conditions. And so we have an analogous quantity called the Murphy vapor point efficiency. And all this says, the, the formulas are actually the same. The variables are all the same. All we're saying here is in recognition of the fact that um, this Murphy kind of uh, vapor point efficiency is, is exactly specific to where we've taken our sample out of the column. And it's something you don't want to forget if you're ever doing this type of work that um, if you're making that well-mixed assumption, that's fine, but you have to sort of always remember that that's happening. And you can imagine sometimes these um, long needle syringes would actually permit taking multiple samples across the tray. You can stick the syringe all the way in, take one sample, stick the needle halfway in, take another sample, and then maybe just uh, a little bit in past that sample port. So these are things to think about as an engineer that aren't obvious when we're just doing graphical design problems under these ideal cases. The, the, the good news is, and, and um, if everything is well mixed, these two uh, efficiencies, the mercury vapor efficiencies are identical, of course. Um, and other than that, we just want to really be keeping in mind this sort of point uh, example from being well mixed. So let's zoom out a little bit in terms of what we really need to know um, for moving forward in, the, in the class, and then we're going to take a break. So three things I want you, I'm going to introduce one new thing here. So two things we already know. We have this concept of overall efficiency. So this is a quick metric. 
the number of theoretical stages divided by the number of actual stages uh, is an overall efficiency. Then um, remembering that the number of actual stages will always be equal or greater to the number of theoretical stages. So this will be one or less always. Um, in general, we're just going to make use of this Murphy vapor efficiency. So we're going to just assume this well mixed thing is happening and that we can just have um, this kind of concept in play right here. Now, you might um, have noticed this is uh, V, Murphy vapor efficiency, because we're looking at the uh, approach to equilibrium from the point of view of vapor. Th there's an analogous quantity, EML, which is the Murphy liquid efficiency, that will deal with the actual and predicted liquid phase compositions. In my experience, this is a less common quantity, but it, it works in the exact same way. So the Murphy liquid efficiency is defined here. And again, it's a ratio of mole fractions. So we have the mole fraction of liquid entering the column to the mole fraction of liquid on stage. That's the top, the numerator. Then we're gonna take a sample of the vapor phase um, and we're gonna back calculate from VLE what the liquid phase composition ought to be. And the denominator is the, diff is, is the predicted liquid phase composition from the liquid phase composition uh, entering the column. And again, that's gonna be a fraction. Um, uh, and so these three are the sort of relationships that we're going to need in order to do some real analysis. So let's take a, a five minute break. We're gonna come back and do a sample problem. We're gonna do the same thing that I, um, actually what I'll do uh, briefly when we come back from the break is show you qualitatively how these concepts are used. And then we're gonna jump in and do a sample problem. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and take that break and then um, we will kind of jump right in. So I, uh, 12.42, let's come back at 12.47. Um, see you in a few minutes.
Okay, welcome back. Got my coffee, I'm ready to go. Got a couple questions coming in and then, uh, like I said, keep sending them if you wanna ask any more. What I'm gonna do now for uh, very quickly is show you qualitatively, just like with a cartoon sketch, how we use these efficiencies and then I'll take all the questions and then we'll do a sample problem. So making use of the Murphy vapor efficiency, so this is EMV, making use of this for absorber design. I have two sketches here. Um, for the moment, ignore the sketches just for a second, but let's assume that we have um, been provided the stage-by-stage -stage efficiency values or an efficiency value for the whole tower. If we have 100% efficiency, so I'm gonna highlight this in, in light blue, 100% um, efficiency, would look like this. So there would be, this is the one that we did last week for the absorber. There's three equilibrium stages in that case. Now, to make use of the Murphy vapor efficiency, this is the process. So the vertical line that we step off from the operating line to the equilibrium line. So we're going from the operating line to the equilibrium line. I'll go over this many times today because it is a sticking point that can be a little confusing. That is scaled by the amount of efficiency. So if EMV is 50%, like this example I'll show you, what that means is as I'm going from that operating line to the equilibrium, I'm only achieving 50% of equilibrium. So I'm gonna stop halfway and then pretend that that's my point that is sort of like the quasi equilibrium and then resume stepping my stages. So Let's see how this would work as follows. Remember, we're gonna go from the operating line to the equilibrium line. So here, and instead of going all the way down, I'm gonna go halfway. Then I'm going to go horizontally over to the operating line. And I'm gonna repeat that again and again. So each time we're assuming now that every stage has the same vapor efficiency, just for simplicity, I'm achieving half of my approach to equilibrium. That's the, because it has 50% efficiency. And you can see I get all the way down to the bottom and it just fortuitously worked out that I'm exactly hitting the nodes on the operating line. I'll address that point in a moment. So in this case, when we had 50% efficiency, the number of stages was six. Now, I wanna emphasize the number of stages didn't double because my efficiency went down by 50%. That is not correct. We have to go through this analysis and you'll see examples when that doesn't happen and n might be, it'll be certainly greater than three, but it's all gonna depend on the relationship between the operating line and the equilibrium line. So uh, we're gonna see this several more times today uh, and I'll kind of walk you through each time how, how it's gonna work. For the stripping tower, now let's say we're working with EML, the Murphy liquid efficiency for the stripper design. Here, we are looking at the approach to equilibrium in the liquid phase. It's always gonna be going from the operating line to the equilibrium curve. Now we're under the equilibrium curve. So we're gonna be moving uh, right to left from operating line to equilibrium line. The blue, just like last time, I'll highlight that in light blue. The blue is our system that's at 100% efficiency, five stages. So that, that we can see. Now, um, EML of 50% means that the approach to equilibrium is only half. So here we go, let's go through this again. And I'm using this language really carefully. The approach to equilibrium means uh, we didn't have enough residence time. We didn't have enough surface area. Some, something held us back from getting all the way to equilibrium. And that's why we're thinking about this idea of going from the operating line to the equilibrium curve. And here, I got halfway there. Remember, uh, in liquid, we're going left to right, back down to the operating line, left, uh, right to left, sorry, back down to the operating line. Each time I'm going half of that X distance. So I'm gonna do that all the way down. The first couple times you do this on your own, it's rather messy. Uh, I recommend a pencil or drawing it in a computer program like I am here. 
And so here we have um, with this idea that in the stripping tower, we're trying to get the liquid composition below our original value in order to achieve our separation. Uh, we need 10 stages in order to do that. And again, I emphasize this is not because we're at 50%. It's just a, a, a result of the way that I drew these curves. I didn't really realize both of them had that. And so um, we'll see examples where that doesn't occur. So in the problem that we're going to do, this will come up again, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk it through one more time. But now I'm going to take some questions. I've got kind of four questions here that have piled up, and you can send some more to Lynette. Uh, again, we want to focus on these definitions and qualitative concepts. Then we're going to jump in to this example problem. So the first question was, um, actually, what, let me just go back to this right here. Um, so somebody just pointed out that there's a typo here. Let me just really, somebody correctly noted that right there, this goes all the way to the equilibrium line, and that is not correct. So thank you, whoever just sent me that note. So that it should not be happening. In that last stage, that should be going, that should be dropping at 50% right here. And then we should have one additional stage um, right there. Uh, going halfway, so on and so forth. Um, it's not, in this case, it's not going to change the number of equilibrium stages to achieve the same separation because you can see that we're sort of ending at that same point, uh, but it was drawn incorrectly. So thank you for that. Okay, back to some questions here. Um, the first question was a qualitative question about this graphical design process. So back to our little diagram here. Here's an equilibrium curve and here's an operating line. So we're playing with absorber design right now. And somebody asked, how come on some of my diagrams, the number of stages exactly matches the ends, the nodes, and sometimes it doesn't. So um, you'll get the hang of this more as you're doing example problems, but it depends on the question we're asking. So in some cases, we are asking the question, what is the outlet composition? given a fixed number of stages. So in that case, we would draw off that many stages. We would typically know the slope of the operating line and then where that final stage exactly matches, then we have um, uh, kind of an exact match. On the other hand, let's say that we knew the inlet and outlet concentrations that we wanted. And the question was simply how many stages are needed in order to achieve this level of separation like this. So here I've kind of drawn with balls, the nodes of the operating line. And, and the question is how many stages do we need? So again, we can step off um, our stages and here the answer, it's very simple, the answer is two. And, and the number of stages now goes past the operating kind of that, that node because it, um, we don't know in advance that there's an exact match. And in reality, these are minimum minima. So we would of course do proper engineering and over design the system. So that's, that's part of the reason why we don't always have that exact correspondence. Okay, jumping into some questions about uh, Murphy efficiencies. First one, um, the efficiencies are, um, use a predicted composition based off a measured composition. So for EML, so, so I think there's some questions about this kind of prediction. So let's go uh, go through it one more time. I see several questions that are of the same nature. So let me grab this and put it on the Q&A slide and then we can mark it up a little more. We'll take EML as an, uh, as an example. Okay, that didn't work. All right, we'll just go back to that slide. I don't wanna waste time with this. So in the liquid phase case right here, um, Everything that doesn't have, a, have an asterisk is measured from the process. So the process is running, we're taking real world samples. Um, and then what we're doing is we're getting the theoretical liquid phase concentration. So the process is uh, you sample YIN. So we're taking a gas phase sample from the process. And then we are back calculating. Um, X, Xn, and that's why it's labeled the asterisk. So the asterisk is a, is a hypothetical quantity. 
given this vapor phase composition, if it is truly in equilibrium, what should the, the liquid phase composition be? So that's why this vapor efficiency works because it tells it's, um, uh, yeah. And so somebody, uh, so in this case, no, it's a vapor phase sample. So it's a liquid efficiency, right? So um, what we've done it, in order to make an estimate of what the liquid composition should be, we are sampling the vapor phase. We have VLE data, sample the vapor phase, we assume it's at perfect equilibrium, and then we back calculate with Ralph's law what X ought to be. Then we compare that to what we're measuring, and that is the efficiency. So likewise, just to be super clear, in the Murphy um, uh, vapor efficiency, it's the opposite. We're, um, we've measured the gas phase composition. And now we're going to figure out what is the theoretical gas phase composition. So I'm going to take a liquid sample, and I'm going to use Ralph's law, and I'm going to calculate what is that theoretical composition, yi star. And the difference between the two, the ratio of that gap, is uh, the efficiency. So I think um, hopefully that clears that up. Um, qualitative question, this is great. Other than the obvious choice of increasing or lowering the liquid vapor flow rates, what other things can we do if we're having entrainment, weeping, flooding? Um, so if you caught it in the example from that uh, trace scan company, they said that they wash the column. So over time, columns degrade, right? So you can have degradation. Let's, let's think about this. If you have oil going through your column, let's say it's a middle cut of, of middle molecular weight components from crude oil. If, if hydrocarbons are hot and you have a metal tray, maybe uh, that tray is made out of some kind of oxide, there could be actual catalytic reactions that occur and you can have buildup of uh, what we scientifically call gunk or crap. W what's really happening is that hydrocarbons are polymerizing. You can form these tars, large molecular weight compounds. Um, you can have adsorption of high molecular weight compounds on surfaces. And all of this serves to sort of lower the diameter of those sieves, gum up the bubble caps, et cetera. And that's why you have regular maintenance in plants. So at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, the entire plant shuts down and you do routine maintenance. So they would do like a high pressure acid wash uh, to clean out the column. And then you would then be able to return to normal operation. So that's one example of many. In the real world, there's any number of things that could go on to, to degrade the way the column is operating. Um, Final question, and then uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on. So does Murphy efficiency change how you draw the operating line? No. So the Murphy efficiency is entirely about the approach to equilibrium. So we're leaving the operating line, and then how close to equilibrium are we getting? So every time you draw these Murphy efficiencies, I want you thinking about that. How am I approaching equilibrium? And then how am I deviating from that? So. We're going to jump in and do a, uh, an example problem. And just like before, I'm going to give you guys two minutes to read this. And um, some of the, this may be a problem. You may want to go back and do yourself in the future. This directly came from a midterm I gave in 2015. So um, yeah, I'm going to start my timer. If you need clarifying questions about the nature of this problem, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to jump in and we're going to go through and do one, two, and three. And we're going to spend some time on point three because there's uh, a bunch of ways, uh, questions you might have. So uh, go ahead and start reading Fire Away.
Okay, so I don't see any questions kind of coming in. Let me just quickly hit the highlights of what we're gonna do here. Uh, we're gonna design a stripping tower we, because we wanna remove um, vinyl chloride from contaminated groundwater. And we're gonna use air to do that. You're given the conditions. And then you're also given the uh, feed water composition. So there's four PPM of vinyl chloride in the water. And we're given a design specification that the outlet water can only have 0 0.5 ppm uh, before it's emitted, presumably, um, to some other source, like a river or something. Solubility, so the VLE curve is actually now given directly <clears throat> from Henry's law. And I give you the, the hint here, because we're in this really dilute case, we can exactly draw the, um, the equilibrium curve as follows. It's, it's, uh, pretty, the equilibrium curve is pretty straightforward. And there's three questions that are being asked. <clears throat> What's V min? So what is the minimum amount of equilibrium stages or uh, of vapor flow rate in order to achieve this at infinite stages? And then given some operating ratio of V to V min, what are the number of stages you need? And then given uh, uh, a Murphy efficiency, how many stages are needed? So let's jump in and just kind of uh, work through this together. The first thing that we have to do is draw the VLE curve, or in this case, a VLE line, because it's Henry's law. Um, so on the exam, uh, the piece of graph paper you have in front of you is what you were given in 2015. And again, I want to get back to that point about drawing the, um, what, you know, X, the, the range, minimum, maximum, so on and so forth. So we know on X that we're going to be dealing with a range of 0 to 4, more or less, because that is the um, the number of ppm. This is uh, x right here. Um, and um, we also know on y, we can calculate using the VLE curve, uh, kind of what that upper range should be. So we get a value. Uh, we know um, that the VLE curve is going to kind of take us through this range. So uh, what I show you here is that 0 0.8 ppm um, is what you, you can use. So another insight um, was that you could directly use PPM uh, as a composition metric here because it was so dilute uh, and label it just as, as 0.8. It, it's higher than the mole fraction. Um, and, and so that's something you could have converted it to Y if you wanted to, uh, that exact mole fraction, but it's not required. So with this in hand, the first thing that we need to do is actually determine v min. That's part two. So um, we know the conditions at the bottom of the stripping tower. This is our minimum design constraint, 0 0.5. And we're feeding in um, air. So it's neat air. There's no vinyl chloride in there. And we are going to intersect that point with um, the top of the column, where x uh, at the top, the input, x prime is equal to 4 here. From this, we can directly calculate the slope. There's a couple different ways you can do this. You can just algebraically calculate the slope. Or if, you're, uh, if you choose, you can do what I did, and you can draw that curve just like that, and then use all four points and calculate the slope. There's no right way or wrong way to do this. But once you go through and calculate the slope of the line, you recall that that's L prime over V prime min, in this case, the way uh, we have it intersecting. We know L prime, and so then we can directly calculate what V min is. 6.6 .6 kilomoles per hour is the answer here. So that gives us the baseline. The, uh, if we had infinite number of stages, what is the minimum flow rate of air that we would have in order to achieve this separation? Now, doing some design. We know that we're going to run um, faster than um, uh, the vapor flow rate will be faster than Vmin. So I just want to note, um, I wrote 2.5 here. And I just realized that this says 1.5. So I'll correct that later. Don't worry about it. It's uh, not going to change the way we're analyzing the problem. Um, 
but in this in this case that we have here with this operating line slope of, of 0.126, we can connect, uh, we can start drawing from this design constraint down here at the bottom with a slope of 0.126. And we can determine that at the um, top of the column, we have these two values. X prime is 4 ppm and, and Y is about 0 0.5 ppm. So we can draw the operating line connecting the two nodes, and then we can begin stepping off the number of equilibrium stages. So uh, this is a case where we know the nodes of the operating line, and we're being asked how many equilibrium stages are required in order to achieve this separation. At this point, we don't know anything about efficiencies. And so we can achieve this separation in four equilibrium stages. Remember the, um, the value of X has to be 0 0.5 or, or lower uh, at the end. So four stages is, is great. That's kind of the answer to this part. Then the next question has to do with, um, oh, and I just want to kind of illustrate um, this point right here. Um, you may have wanted to know, like, which end do you start at when you're stepping and does it matter? So here is an example where I've started at the bottom and I'm stepping up toward the top. This is not, um, the, the, the choice to start at the top or bottom is not specific to it being a stripping tower or an absorber. It's the fact that our process has four PPM coming in. So that's, that is what the process requires. So in this case, I have to start this process of stepping from four. I've, I've shown here as an example what happens if you do the stage stepping starting from the bottom. And you're still going to get, in, in almost all cases, you will still get the correct answer. So in this case, you do get the correct answer of n equals four equilibrium stages. However, if I had asked a question, for example, what is the liquid composition on the second tray or stage, you would not get that correct. So, um, and you're also not sort of getting the, the mole balance correct here because your predicted liquid concentration on, on stage four is not correct. So you do want to be really careful. It seems a lot of times um, we don't take the time to explain why we're doing one way or the other. Um, and so I want, I'm trying to do my best to make really clear the type of questions you might have uh, since you're not here in the classroom with me. Um, just kind of be thinking about what is your goal in the problem and what do you know um, and be thinking about those boundary conditions. 0.5 is the, the maximum outlet. If your groundwater, if your, if your water released to the environment has less than 0.5, great. There's no problem at all with that. Uh, but in terms of we can assume this is sort of like a regulatory thing. We've got to remove it down to 0.5 ppm before it's emitted to the environment. So moving along, let's talk about efficiencies. So number one, um, the problem didn't say what type of efficiency it was. Maybe you noticed that. Just said 75% mercury efficiency. That was by design. Um, you can assume, in this case for this problem, you could assume vapor or liquid. And if you did it right, you'd get full credit. If you didn't recognize that it was one or the other, you might have gotten you know, nine and a half points out of 10. But it's important to be thinking about these definitions we had today in class, and then also with understand what you're working with. So we're going to take for the moment, assuming that this is the Murphy liquid efficiency. And let's look here at our example. So we're gonna start at the top at a value of X is four. And here um, we've got, 75% in our approach to equilibrium. And you can see here that I thought it was 50%. So I'm going to do it correctly in, uh, let's do it in yellow. So the Murphy, if the Murphy liquid phase efficiency is 50%, uh, I've drawn it correctly, but um, I'll, I'll use a different color. So 75% should be three quarters of the way from the operating line to the equilibrium curve. So when I went through this, I missed that. You drop down to the operating line. And again, I'm gonna go about 75% of the way. 
drop down to the operating line. Students always want to know like how accurate do you have to be when you're doing this analysis. And the truth is these are graphical methods are approximate. And if you're a little off, if your line's not exactly straight, it's not a big deal. It's very evident to us when we're grading um, that you understand or uh, have missed, you have a, a small deficiency in some of the concepts. And let's count off these uh, stages. So we've got one, two, three, four, uh, five is the number of stages right here. So um, that makes sense. The answer I did at 50%, um, so it's actually n equals five. I apologize for that mix up. Um, and if we have it solved here twice, so it's seven stages, that totally makes sense. If you, your efficiency goes down, the number of stages you have goes up. Um, so I'm anticipating that there will be a fair number of questions. Um, I think your class technically goes until 120. So I'm going to, let's keep going. And then if, if there, if there are a lot of questions, I'll kind of restart on Thursday and make sure we, we hit this pretty hard because it, uh, it's almost certainly going to show up, uh, on your exam as you move forward. So. What I want to now talk about is a much harder problem to solve, which is what if you had assumed it was the vapor efficiency and we're designing the stripping tower? So here, things get a little confusing. Uh, how, how are we going to approach this? Let me walk you through first, what is the wrong way to do it? And this is how most students in my experience would approach it. So just to be really clear, in case you're watching at home, what I'm showing you right now is incorrect. So obviously four PPM is at fixed value. So we know we can't start at the other side of the column. We already talked about why that's wrong. So let's say we start at four PPM and we work our way um, over here. We're, we're in vapor phase efficiency now. Now what do we do? We're at the, we're at the equilibrium curve. So without thinking, a lot of people would say, oh, well, I'll just go 75% of the way down to the operating line and that'll probably be fine. 75% doesn't matter if it's up or down. So we can go through and step off our stages just like I've done. This is correct. This, the, this efficiency is 75%. And we can see we can come up with N equals six. Um, I note here, you're probably gonna be within one stage if you do this, but the concept is totally wrong. Um, remember, it's about the approach to equilibrium, not the, the approach to the operating line doesn't matter. It's not a thing that we're going to be thinking about. So the correct answer is to guess um, what, what is the composition on stage and then verify and see if the efficiency is right. So let me show you what that looks like. There's three examples here of different Murphy vapor efficiencies. So the first thing I did, I still started at my value of 0 0.4. And just as a reminder, if I go all the way over and all the way down, that's 100% efficiency. So we know that's wrong. Now I'm just going to pick an arbitrary value. I'm going to highlight that and let's just pick a different color. Here's purple. Let's say I just went out to here and then I went down. So what we can now do is think, well, what is the corresponding vapor efficiency? And if we look up, right, so follow all the way up to the, up to the equilibrium curve, that's around one fifth of the way or 20%. So what I've done is I've initially drawn that and my initial guess is 20%, that's too low. The, the answer is that the, you know, we're working with an EMV value of 75%. So now we'll go somewhere in the middle and here's the correct one. So if I go out to about here and down, then I can see that I've got around three, three quarters in terms of that pink line compared to the height from operating line to equilibrium line. It's about 75%. So in some cases, depending on how the problem is established, you will find yourself having to do this guess, or guess and check. Um, and you're going to have to do this at each stage until you get to the number of stages uh, at or below x equals 0 0.5 ppm. So this is um, kind of like a level up. It's a little trickier than, than what we've been used to doing. 
And what it looks like is here. So here is the 75% value. Um, that bottom line, I'm just kind of drawing off to the edge. It does not connect to the equilibrium line, but I've done this and I'm not showing you all my errors, but each stage now has around 75% um, equilibrium in, uh, or 75% Murphy equilibrium. It, depending on the ratio, it's not guaranteed that you're gonna, that it's exactly uh, the, the, the delta between the, this point. So just to be really clear, it is not guaranteed that that delta X and that delta Y are equal in terms of percent. There's no reason to think that. So if it's, burp, if it's Murphy vapor phase efficiency, and we find ourselves to solve the problem, having to do this, you'll real, you should realize really quickly, if you keep it clear in your mind, what we're doing. Again, it's an approach to equilibrium on each stage. So, um, you know, st at this number four, I'm gonna make it 75% of the way to equilibrium. That's my mercury vapor phase efficiency. Then I'm gonna cut over right toward um, the final point. Okay, so that was probably um, not, that was a lot. And, and if you didn't get it right away, no worries. We're gonna, I'll be in office hours tomorrow and I'll do a recap of this on, um, Thursday at the beginning of class. Big picture, what did we do today? We talked about efficiency. So equilibrium is not always achieved on stage. It doesn't matter if it's trade tower pack column. We talked about different mechanisms of failure and kind of did some qualitative analysis of those mechanisms of failure. And talked about theoretically what those mechanisms of mass failure can be attributed to in terms of mass transfer fluxes. And then the, the important thing for problem solving quantitatively is using these Murphy efficiencies and understanding how it works with this process of connecting the operating line and the equilibrium line. Um, so it's, you will have to know how to do that in all the cases that we kind of looked at, verb, uh, vapor, liquid, and depending on the problem setup, the guess and check method or the method that's more evident. So, you know, big picture, go slow, pay close attention to the known variables and do a lot of practice and ask for help and we'll be, we'll be ready to help you. So uh, it's 120 right now, class is officially over and I'll be happy to stick around if people have any questions. Otherwise have a great day and I'll talk to you on Thursday. I don't see any questions coming in from anybody. So this is kind of last call in case you um, do have any questions. Um, just a quick question on the, when you're connecting the lines, I've noticed like, is it just every single time you connect the lines, you start from the top right and then you go either vertical down or um, horizontal? Right, so it, it will depend on the problem statement. The um, the one, it just is a kind of a, a coincidence that we, um, the, um, the problem that we've had, we've sort of had this starting on the right-hand side. Um, the, we could have had, for example, the problem that we just did, right? If we had said, um, 
the outlet water concentration is 0 0.5 ppm. There are seven equilibrium stages. What is the inlet water composition? In that case, you would start on the left-hand side and you'd step up seven stages, and then you'd see what is the value of X. So it is gonna be unique to each problem statement, and we're gonna be doing a similar thing in binary distillation, and you'll see, uh, again, there, there are cases when you start kind of at the, what, you know, what is equivalently the top or the bottom of the column. Um, you'll you'll wanna sort of think about the problem kind of in the way that I'm talking about it, right? The, what is being asked of me? What is the design constraint or design specification? And that should normally make it evident where you'll start on the operating line when you do this um, stepping procedure. So for example, for like a stripper, the flow of the bottom of the stripper, then we would probably start from the bottom and move upwards in the horizontal in that form. Oh, are, so are you talking actually, um, yeah, let me share my screen. I think I, I, I misunderstood your question. Sorry about that. Let me. Um... So I remember from office hours, I was doing problem four in the homework and I was told that since it was at the bottom of the stripper, we would start from the bottom and moving up. But then from today's lecture, I've kind of like conflicting information. So yeah, I'm well, if we so start from the top. It, 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 no, but let me just clarify. There are problems in stripping tower design in which you would start at the top. It just depends on, on how the problem statement is clarified. It's more common, so let's remind ourselves in the stripping tower, right? What we're doing is we're clean, we're basically cleaning a liquid. So we have some X out value. And so if we think about that, the normal use case for um, the normal use case for these types of problems is, is that we are going to have a design constraint at the bottom of the column. Like there is some liquid composition uh, that we can't exceed. And then we wanna um, kind of reverse engineer what is the number of stages. That's, you know, if we're think, but there are many other examples where we wouldn't do that. So uh, it just so happens that the kind of first examples we typically do kind of feature that. So. I think that was your question about where you start. Like now here's a kind of fictional equilibrium curve and then there's, um, this is this operating line. Were you asking that versus how, actually which, how the stepping process goes, like which direction you're going? Um, can you, maybe I want, I just wanna make sure I'm kind of understanding what you're asking. Yeah, so I was just not sure um, like how you can tell for fact, cause I thought, I think just from today's lecture, I just thought that it was just always from the top right and depending if it's um, EMV or not, it depends on like which way, if it's like observer oh. or stripper. Or, okay, um, so so no, so, so it, it's about the approach to equilibrium. And in so with the stripper and EM and, and EML, the Murphy liquid phase efficiency, it's very straightforward because we are at some high value of X we're stripping, we're moving that solute to the liquid phase. So X is gonna go down. So X is gonna go from right to left on stage as we approach equilibrium, right? And if we, if we totally approach the equilibrium, uh, we, would, we would hit, we would come in contact with the equilibrium curve, but the vapor efficiency or the liquid efficiency tells us where kind of what, what percent of the way are we achieving equilibrium? That's why we're stopping at that fraction of, um, the kind of approach to equilibrium, and then we go down. So there, we're not saying anything about the vapor phase in this case. So we just go back down to the operating line and, and repeat that process going over whatever, whatever fraction of, of the distance is. It's, it's kind of a, you can think of it as a geometric thing. So um, that's, that, always, that typically works, you know, this, this design process, the way I drew it, so that we're not having to do the guess or check approach and that we are able to sort of, um, you know, it's a straightforward problem in the sense that we're beginning the way students like to and, and doing it. Now, there's different ways to formulate the problem, as I've noted a couple times now, and I can't go over every different way because there's really a lot of different ways. But I'll just simply note, in the absorber case, when the operating line's up here, um, this is a bad example because the there's... Um, such a big gap, sorry. But basically it's the same concept. We're gonna strike the equilibrium line. This is liquid. And now, um, oh no, I said that wrong, totally, sorry. 
Um, we can't do that. This was the wrong way to do it that I just illustrated. As we go from the operating line to equilibrium and vapor, again, it's, it's about, this is kind of why you, I, I, it's easy to get confused. You always want to use this language in your head. It's the approach to equilibrium. What percent of the way am I getting toward equilibrium? Sorry, this is super messy. Um, so hopefully that makes sense a little bit. And, and again, I just want to emphasize, um, I want to practice with problems, kind of work on kind of getting that language just right in your head, nice and clear. And then I, I think I, and I expect it'll begin to make more and more sense kind of as you go forward. So um, yeah. Anything else? I mean, do you want to clarify anything else or do you want to talk about it tomorrow in office hours maybe? And I'll try to give it a try, but thank you for the explanation though. It makes yeah. sense there. Okay. I ask a following up question to that diagram you just drew for the stripper. Yep. Um, so you were talking uh, in that example you gave us, we started from the top with the Murphy liquid um, efficiency. Would we start from the bottom if we had the Murphy vapor efficiency then? Because you're approaching equilibrium. No, so 75%. It would, um, whether you start from the top or the bottom is going to be determined by the problem statement and what is known and what's your objective. So let's, um, let me just put that screen back up and then we can. Um... I guess uh, the, I, I can think of this, I can like mull it over more too, but I think mm -hmm. the thing that's confusing me the most, and maybe this will help you, I guess, in terms of figuring out my confusion, is that you say that it's because we have the, the fixed point of 0.4 at the top. But when mm -hmm. I look at my operating line, I see all points, both points as being fixed. Does that make sense? It, yeah, and, and you're right. So, so they are fixed, but remember, 0.5 is sort of like we, we put that there as a, as a worst case scenario. So you have to really internalize what the problem is asking for. And in this case, the problem is saying in this process, you, you had a liquid stream coming into your stripping tower and it is four, right? And you got to get it at least to 0.5. So this is this concept of engineering design with constraints. And chemical engineers learn how to do this, and they do it well. So the, the constraint is 0.5. Now, again, we can do better than that if we want to, but that's generally not going to be economical. If you're, um, if you're designing a new process, and, and the uh, EPA tells you, you got to get that number to 0.5, you're not going to go tell your boss, here's a stripping tower that gets it to 0.005. Um, that's not, the company's not going to do that. They're going to design it to achieve whatever is, uh, in this case, the, the minimum requirement for an environmental standard, because that max, that, that sort of in your mind should be intuitive that that will maximize profit. That's a little uncomfortable to think about as we're thinking about environment. Um, and it's not always so cut and dry, but this is a good way to at least begin to think about like, why, why do we have a design constraint? And what does that mean? And then what does that mean for the design of the process? Um, eventually, like next winter, you'll learn how to actually do economic analysis. So you can put a dollar sign on this example and you'll be able, for example, to do the, the, the trade-off. What if it's 0.6? How much does that cost? What if it's 0.4? So um, when I say the nodes are fixed, the, the four the, at, the, at the upper part of the operating line, that four is a constraint from upstream in the process. So some other engineer is saying that number is four. You can't change it. So that's why your analysis will begin from there. The downstream, the, the 0.5 is, is a, um, a limit. It's not the value that it has to be. And as such, we, we will sort of typically not hit it on the head with the number of equilibrium stages, but we'll, we'll be below that number. Does that help? Yes, actually it does. Good, good. And this it is- does. Uh, yeah, no, but I'm, th that's great because that, that approach and thinking is, is really the heart of chemical engineering. And we're going to, we're going to hit you guys with this over and over in reactor design, process design, because that, that sort of constraint based thinking is um, one of the most important things you learn in your kind of uh, coursework to become a chemi. So I'm glad that made sense. Okay. Yes. I'm going to try and go over the other problems that we, the practice problems cool. we've done and apply that same and if I get confused again, I'll ask a question, but I think I get yeah. it now. Cool. Yeah. Thank awesome. you. Thank you very much. Of course. Hello. Yep. Hey.
Can I ask super quick uh, conceptual question for uh, like yeah. the homework 4D? So it's saying, okay, with the Murphy efficiency at 85%, now use the same number of stages as you did when it's 100% efficiency and see like um, what's the outlet. And it says mm -hmm. that the, inlet, the inlet conditions are still the same. So that would mean that the, uh, let's see, the X value of the, of the top would stay the same, but the Y value mm -hmm. wouldn't, right? Because now, because the Y value of the, of the top of the stripper is the outlet and that could change also, right? That is correct. And then for the, for the bottom, the Y value would stay the same because that's the inlet for gas and then, but the X value would change. Um, so do I have to like, hmm, do I have to like move those points, slide those points up and down and left to right until like I can make four st a staircase with four uh, basically steps on it. Yeah. So, so you want to focus in, you know, the, the, a good way to think about it for the stripping tower, you want to focus in on like the X values and for the absorber, you want to focus in on the Y values. Cause those are the, like the streams where you're, you know, you're, you're trying to do the engineering, like you're moving something from gas to liquid. So mm -hmm. you'll, your operating line in this case should not be changed because you haven't changed V prime or L prime. So the liquid and gas flow rates are the same. So, you know, so you um, keep the slope the same. Or that's, what? that's exactly un unless they've unless you've been told the slope uh, L prime or V prime changes, the operating line slope will be the same. That's exactly right. Oh. Um, and and so what that's going to do then is as you're stepping the stages, in the approach to equilibrium, it'll it'll change how far you get. So for the absorber, if you're feeding in a fixed amount, and then your efficiency goes down at a fixed number of stages, you're gonna get less material out of that vapor phase. Mm -hmm. So the habit you wanna get into, as you're you know, spending the time now as you're qualitatively thinking about this is like, what am I doing? Okay, absorber. I'm moving something from gas to liquid. If the efficiency goes down, then I expect I'm gonna have less uh, material moving to the liquid phase. And so the Y value, right? The amount of stuff in the gas phase coming out is going to increase because I'm doing a, my, my, my work of moving stuff from gas to liquid in the absorber is uh, not as good. It's not as my efficiency has gone down. So that process of walking through kind of what your expectations are and then mapping that on to the, the, the graphical analysis is, is essential for um, mastering these concepts. So yeah, that's hopefully that helps. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Unfortunately, guys, I'm gonna have to go. Um, but send questions on Canvas or uh, go to office hours, and uh, I'll see you all Thursday. Have a great day.